Welcome, welcome everybody. Today, I am super excited to have a very special training for you guys, how to sell in Amazon Japan in 2023. I'm very excited to have two special guests with us here today. Um, I'd like to quickly first introduce and welcome Bichu Java, co-founder of PPC Ninja. How's it going, Bichu? Hey, Gary. Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Good. Okay, great. And also, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Nick Katz, joining us all the way from Japan. How are you doing, Nick? Welcome, welcome. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Thanks very much. Excellent. All right. So we have some people coming in the room. I'm super excited about the opportunity <coughs> today, guys. And um, we'll have time for questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And uh, before that, if you can please mute yourself um, just to maintain the, the sound quality of the call. All right. So uh, I'm just curious. We have several dozen people in the room already. If you'd like to type your name, where you're joining us from, and um, you know, maybe what's your biggest question about um, selling in Japan. All right. So, okay. And let me just quickly um, set, the, set the table for today and I'll go ahead and I will share my screen so we can get started. Okay, so today, as we're approaching the end of the year, um, I wanted to share with you what I think is probably the best kept secret about, um, about selling on Amazon. And it's kind of funny, this is like, you know, it is a secret, right? I mean, and it's to sell on Amazon Japan. And it's, it's kind of amazing to me that, you know, Japan is the, the fourth biggest Amazon marketplace in the world. And almost nobody is talking about it. I mean, I think the only two people talking about it are here on the webinar today. You know, Nick Katz and Ritu. I, right? I haven't, I haven't done a very good job, thing, Gary. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially you know, I with mean. like the usual media outlets and podcasts and Facebook groups. Yeah. I mean, almost nobody is talking about it. Yeah. So I really kind of wanted to, you know, let the cat out of the bag, especially as you know, sellers are planning their strategies, you know, growth in 2023. Um, so Japan is the fourth biggest marketplace. And curiously enough, I, I had a conversation with someone at Amazon last night. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but I learned that internally, Amazon is planning a big push for the Japanese marketplace as well in 2023. So I wouldn't be surprised, you know, for sellers, if you will see some incentives, if you may see some, you know, um, you know promotions or motivation from the Amazon side. I really wanted to cover, you know, the basis today. That's why I wanted to bring on Ritu and Nick to give you an overview of selling on Amazon Japan. All right. Um, and I'd like to quickly welcome Karen from San Jose and Mike from Detroit. Good to have you guys. All right. Um, so prior to the today's training, I I sent out a poll and we pulled about 133 people. Um, you know, which marketplaces you're selling it. So, you know. 75% of the people are selling in the U.S., 15 in EU, 22% are, percent are selling in Canada, 9% um, in Mexico, 14% uh, Australia. Um, but I'm very surprised, um, you know, almost, I think there was like one person selling in Japan, right? So literally, I mean, this is a marketplace that nobody is selling into. I mean, come on, guys, there's huge market out there and there's not that much competition, especially from Western sellers. And I kind of feel, you know, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, nobody's talking about it. It's like, you know, you know, cue uh, Will Ferrell from Elf, right? Holiday, I think that's ridiculous, right? So uh, very quickly, you know, in, in our pre-webinar survey, these are some reasons why people want to sell in Japan, right? It's the fourth largest market, growth, expanding globally. Um, we believe Japanese will love our products, scale our business. It, it will save heaps of logistics and shipping costs from China. You know, it proximity wise, you know, only takes about a week or so uh, for a container from Shanghai to, to Japan. So you'll save money um, on that side as well, right? You know, we'll, we'll cover more reason, but, you know, just on a high level, I do feel it's kind of like a blue ocean. You know, there's a lot fewer competitors in Japan compared to a lot of the other marketplaces that are a lot smaller. Okay. Um, but at the same time, you know, a lot of people are intimidated you know, selling it to Japan, you know, we asked, what's the biggest challenge keeping you from selling? You know, there's language barriers or no 
understanding of what's involved. You know, some people just flat out admit it. You know, I'm totally ignorant about the marketplace. You know, I don't know a thing about it, right? Um, and there's also you know regulations, compliance, etc. So we'll tackle through many of these issues today, right? That's why I think it's so important. All right. Um, so um, other than that, you know, okay. So let me give you the the game plan for today. So. Today, we're going to go through um, why you should sell on Amazon Japan. You know, why do some sellers stumble and fall before they even start? Will my products sell in Japan at all? What tools to use? Um, you know, product research, PPT. Uh, there are some tools out there that can help you. Um, what are the Japanese laws and regulations you got to be aware of? As well as um, you know, free on translation, localization. And also, uh, we'll share an external marketing channel native to Japan. Probably never heard of. Most of you have not heard of. Um, you know, sellers like Nick, um, they're using this to really crush Japan. All right. I'd like to first introduce Ritu Java. Ritu is um, the co founder of PPC Ninja. And not too many people know this, but she actually lived for over 17 years in Japan. She's fluent in Japanese. You know, she used to sell on Etsy as well. Um, so she has a high degree of knowledge about Japan. And she worked with many sellers when it comes to Japan PPC and also their market. So, um, Welcome again to, to Ritu. And I also like to quickly introduce our friend Nick. Nick is also an alumni speaker of Seven Figure Seller Summit, uh, over 25 years experience in Japanese, Japan retail. He's currently based in Japan, in Shizuoka, Seven Figure Amazon Seller in Japan, EU. And he runs an agency to help larger brand owners, Japan market and true strategy. And he's going to share some successful best practices, you know, what's working right now in Japan. All right. So, um, Today's uh, today's training will be more free flow, um, and I hope to keep it interactive because I know a lot of you guys had questions coming into the webinar, and feel please feel free to type them in, in the chat so we can get to as many questions. Okay, um, so to start off, um, I, I like to ask our, our panelists, Ritu and Java. I mean, in your opinion, why should sellers sell in Japan? Uh, Ritu, what do you think? Yeah, I, I just think that the opportunity is huge. And uh, like you said, you know, it's the fourth largest uh, marketplace on Amazon. And also Amazon internally is kind of trying to push for Japan next year. Uh, 2023 is going to be uh, very important um, for that reason. Um, well, I think, it you know, the timing is right because, you know, um, it, traditionally, um, you know, there's been a few different uh, marketplaces in Japan that have, kind of uh, overshadowed uh, Amazon, you know, Rakuten being one of the biggest ones, right? And there's a, a bunch of others that speak to different demographics. Uh, but during COVID, uh, all that changed because, um, you know, because of Amazon's logistics and because of the way they've, uh, they have a process and a system uh, for delivering uh, fast and uh, having selection, um, you know, and uh, just being, uh, you know, such a huge uh, kind of uh, trustworthy um, entity portal, um, you know, things have changed. And, um, you know, last I uh, looked at the data, it just showed that uh, both Rakuten and um, Amazon uh, were kind of uh, neck to neck in competition in terms of like, which one has um, more uh, revenue. I think, um, Amazon actually uh, went a step ahead of Rakuten. So I just think that um, timing is uh, good, um, you know, because uh, Amazon is actually gaining a lot of market share um, in Japan and mind share too. Uh, so it just makes sense to kind of uh, really use this opportunity to understand, I think, really get uh, a good understanding of what it takes to be a seller in Japan. Now, obviously, it won't be for everybody, right? So that's why uh, we're having this uh, webinar today to, to kind of try and understand where you fit, where your products fit in the Japanese marketplace. Uh, and um, if there is an opportunity that you can find, um, you know, at the end of uh, this conversation today, uh, then definitely go back and uh, look at the steps uh, seriously and, you know, you know, see what you can do uh, to make an entry into this marketplace because uh, competition is quite low. Excellent. Yeah, I, I'd like to just echo that comment on uh, what Ritu said about um, Amazon's popularity in um, in Japan, because I was living, <laughs> my family and I were living in Japan for two and a half years during the pandemic. And, you know, living in Japan, I noticed the Amazon boxes everywhere. I mean, we were living um, in a city first in Naha, Okinawa, and then we lived in a rural village. 
in Okinawa. And even there, you know, I was able to order everything from, you know, baby diapers to like a nice um, you know, TV projector for a movie night. You know, like literally, you know, people can buy almost anything off of Amazon. Japan, you know, FBA works, you know, very fluidly in Japan, you know, very similar to, you know, the States and other parts of the world. So, um, yeah, 100%. So, um, Nick, I'm curious, in your perspective, why should sellers sell in Japan? Um, well, I think, I think we too touched on many of the most important points. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think Amazon sellers fall into two very large groups. Um, sellers that only sell in their own marketplace. Nothing wrong with that. Everyone has to start off in one marketplace or maybe not their own marketplace, just one of the marketplaces. So there's plenty of sellers outside the US who start and stay in the US. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're then looking to uh, uh, move to other markets, I always think it's a lot easier to take your existing products to a new marketplace than than have to create whole new products and launch new products in an existing marketplace. It's often easier just to sell in one of the others. The options are Germany, the UK, and Japan. Anything beyond that is fine, but I don't think is the best use of your time. Um, uh, Amazon for the last five, six years in their annual reports only breaks out four countries. And that's those four countries, America, Germany, UK, and Japan. And all the other countries are grouped into rest of world. I mean, Amazon considers them just rest of world. They don't even have their own category or their own numbers in the, in the annual reports. So if you're already saying in America and maybe in Europe, then the next marketplace, if it's not Japan, it, it doesn't really make sense to me to have the effort to launch in another country, unless it's English speaking, say like Canada which makes a lot of sense, especially if you're in the US, because there's lots of internal um, systems within Amazon to easily sell in Canada. That makes total sense. But other marketplaces don't seem to make as much sense. Why not Japan? It's the, it's the fourth largest Amazon marketplace. It's the third largest by GDP. Uh, it has double the population of the UK. Um, it has so much opportunity. I don't really understand why people spend so much time launching in smaller marketplaces when if they focus on Japan, um, you could probably do a, you could probably do a lot better. I understand the reasons why people don't want to, and we are going to touch on those today. But um, if you if you're looking to sell in another marketplace, Japan is should definitely be on your radar. And I firmly believe that any brand could probably sell at least, if not more, than they do even in the US, depending on the product, obviously. Um, just because, or make more money selling in Japan, make more profit. Because you don't need to sell as much as the US. Um, costs are generally lower. PPC costs are generally lower. There is less sophisticated competition, generally. Um, so you could actually have a higher margin, um, I think, in Japan. Certainly higher than Europe. I sell a lot in Europe. And uh, taxes there are an absolute nightmare. And lots of regulations that uh, Amazon sellers have to comply with, especially with the new packaging regulations. Um, and you don't have any of that in Japan. Um, taxes are infinitely cheaper if you have to pay them at all. Uh, but that's not a topic for now. But uh, you will probably make more money per unit selling in Japan than any other marketplace that I know of. So those are my main reasons, I would say. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I see a couple of questions in the chat um, from Karen and from Paul. So um, I let, we will get to them in just one minute. Um, I'd like to first start out with just the general steps you need to take to start selling. Um, can either Nick or me too, can you give like a quick overview? Like let's say, you know, a seller is already selling the US or already selling, you know, one of the EU5 uh, marketplaces. Um, what, what are some of the general steps that they should take? Uh, who wants to take that first? Do you want to take that every two? Um, you can go ahead, Nick, since you're selling in Japan. Uh, okay, well, this is, um... I mean, looking at the, the question from Karen in the chat, this is a perfect example of probably the first thing you want to do. And that's um, kind of Europe is famous for its fairly strict regulations on various things. I just mentioned the packaging requirements for Amazon sellers. Uh, but actually, Japan can be a lot stricter than uh, Europe when it comes to certain products. So the first thing to do is to check if your product uh, is regulated in any way. I don't mean by Amazon, I mean by the, by country on import itself. So Karen's mentioning um, 
water bottles. So water bottles is a perfect example of a product you won't be able just to send into Japan. Um, so Japan has a food sanitation act, which applies to um, not just the food, but any container, food or drinks container. So that would be any plastic Tupperware, any water bottles. They will have to be tested, unfortunately. And the testing can be quite expensive. Um, there are um, approved facilities. There's actually a list um, on the Japanese, one of the Japanese sites. Um, I think it's actually the import uh, the custom site that has the, well, I've got a list if, if you need that later, of um, facilities abroad, but you can get products tested in Japan as well. Um, so when it comes to things like water bottles and having them tested, instantly people think, oh, I need to have them tested. So and that's going to cost a bit of money, so I won't sell. But you have to remember that all the other water bottle sellers will probably be thinking the same thing. So it's kind of a good barrier to entry in a way. Um, there are some sellers I see on Amazon, I'm pretty sure probably didn't have their products tested, but uh, you will have your products withheld at customs if they don't have the certificate. So you need to, first of all, the first thing to do is to speak to an import company um, that often mm -hmm. call uh, importers of record, or just any import company who has a lot of experience with products like, um, uh, I mean, for your instance, with, with food or food or drink uh, kind of related products, and they will tell you the things that you need to do. They will need to be tested. You'll need to have a certificate. Um, that's the first stage because there are some products you can sell in probably any other Amazon marketplace without a problem that will have an issue in Japan. Supplements is another one. Cosmetics, cosmetics, medical devices, um, and anything that touches food or drink are the three main categories that you will have to speak to an import company um, before you make any further steps because you need to be aware of the costs. Um, uh, it depends on, 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 the, on the size of the product as well, how much the costing will, how much it will cost and how many parts there are. So if it's a plastic water bottle, it's just one piece of injected molded plastic, that will be cheaper than if there's a separate seal and lots of other things on it, because each of those needs to be tested, um, which is a pain in the bum. And if you see another seller selling the same product, that doesn't mean to say you don't need testing. The actual testing requirement is per seller. So even if someone is selling the exact same product, it doesn't matter. They've got the license to import it, um, but you don't. So you need to have your own product tested. That's one very important thing and a mistake people often make. But if you've cleared, if you understand your products don't have any of these requirements, then there really isn't anything else that you need to do beyond what you would do to go into any other marketplace. If you've got brand registry, quickly transfer that over to Japan, which is obviously useful to have. Um, you'll need to get some translations done. Uh, Amazon will provide you with translation services sometimes, um, but I recommend getting someone who's aware of um, how Amazon kind of SEO kind of or Amazon, someone who's got experience with Amazon as well as just translation. And then you're kind of ready to go. It's not actually that difficult. It's probably a lot easier than developing and creating an entirely new product for your existing marketplace, put it that way, and cheaper. I mean, people balk at the cost sometimes, you know, like a thousand dollars to get your water bottle tested, but how much is it going to cost you to create a new product? So, um, yeah. Yeah, excellent. That's a bit long winded, yeah. sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I've answered no, Karen's question as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Karen, if you have any follow up um, questions, let us know. Karen also followed up. She said, I don't sell the bottles. I sell the handles that fit the bottles. So, ah, in you know. that case, you'd probably be okay. Uh, you'd probably be okay, but it's probably worthwhile speaking to a uh, uh, company, an import company about that, who we can probably introduce you. Certainly at, at the conference, was going to be mentioned later, um, there will be companies that can help you there. You'll probably be okay. It's worthwhile just kind of checking though. Um, yeah, but I would say it's totally fine. Naturally. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Ritsu, anything you want to add to that? Um, I know that, you know, you do help sellers with uh, not just translation, but localization into Japan as well. Yeah, yeah. So so our focus is more on helping sellers on the listing side of things and uh, localization, uh, the SEO, as Nick was mentioning, um, and just looking at the product market fit from a profitability point of view. So, of course, there's the regulation point of view, which uh, Nick has uh, already covered, where you definitely want to check with um, an importer of record and uh, you know the local kind of testing requirements, et cetera. Uh, but once all that is clear, then you move on to the next stage of really trying to figure out if this product 
product is uh, going to have competition or is it something that uh, is really a good fit for the Japanese market. Um, so product market fit analysis, and then just looking at the aesthetics and the localization. It's not just translation because then you miss out on a lot of the nuances. And, um, you know, I actually had some examples. I don't know at what point we might be able to look at them uh, together. Yeah, but, uh, yeah definitely. Um, let's look at them right now. If you'd like to share okay. your screen. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I can share my screen. So these are just, uh, you know, examples uh, trying to show you how, uh, you know, uh, visuals look uh, in Japan. They're very different. Like they're not uh, the usual, um, you know, how, you know, our aesthetic sense in the West is quite different from how Japanese people uh, look at their packaging, uh, their presentation of information and so on. So I'm actually going to start with, uh, you know, I just want to show you a, like a, 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 a bad example of where someone's uh, messed up a little bit. Um, so here's uh, my screen. I hope it's visible. Um, but this is uh, just a, it's called a de-icing agent for cars. So you basically spray it when, when you have, uh, to basically to pr protect your car windshield from frost, uh, you know, getting uh, frosted and over and stuff like that. So these guys have not made any effort to translate the images, right? You can see everything is in English, just as it is. Uh, no effort made here. Uh, even the listing, uh, even though I have my language set to Japanese, it's still showing in English, which means that they didn't take advantage of Amazon's auto um, translation feature. They just actually entered English into the back end. And so they've kind of uh, lost the ability to, um, uh, to, to win over a Japanese customer. Uh, on the other hand, there's another listing here of a similar product, uh, but you can see uh, the packaging. It's, uh, this is the kind of bold fonts and styles that Japanese people love. You know, um, when I went to Japan the first time I had a culture shock, I was like, why is everything so big and bold? Like, why is it so colorful? And like, why is it so dramatic? I don't know, I'm looking for words that just, uh, you know, try to express what kind of imagery uh, Japanese people love. Okay, so this is the kind of imagery that can can go a long way in you know winning uh, you know or at least getting some attention grabbing some quick attention uh, the other thing that japanese people absolutely love is detail like i cannot emphasize that enough i'm going to show you an example from rakuten which is uh, you know the competitor website uh, or portal uh, just look at this website it's like full of text you just see how much text it's like packed in with information and you won't believe it. This is the kind of stuff that Japanese people absolutely love, you know? So every corner is full of information. It just breeds trust because it appears as though people have really put in the effort to, um, you know, to elaborate on the small things, the details. So if your listing can be, <laughs> you know, can speak to this aesthetic, then you'll, you know, you, you'll have a better chance at success than if you have a kind of plain, boring looking, uh, you know, maybe very beautiful, but doesn't have any information. Uh, it's not gonna do uh, very well. Uh, the other thing I can uh, share real quick is, you know, how a, a few brands have really uh, taken uh, that, uh, that mindset of localizing, not just in text, but also in the imagery, if you look at this, uh, uh, you know, this doesn't look like, a. so this is Maybelline, a very popular, uh, you know, uh, brand here in the, uh, in the United States and Canada, but look how they have localized it. It actually looks like it might have been a Japanese brand, even with this kind of um, font and, uh, you know, the bold kind of outlined font, etc. So these are really good ways of uh, looking at certain, um, you know, uh, prominent kind of uh, website, uh, sorry, not website, storefronts and uh, drawing inspiration from them. Another uh, not great example is Estee Lauder, which is another kind of cosmetic brand. Uh, when I click on their brand, there's no storefront even. So there's nothing, right? So this is an opportunity loss. So I guess there are people that are not paying attention to this, uh, to these details. And uh, if you can uh, be the ones thinking through all this, uh, you know, you have, a, you stand a better chance because yeah, honestly, the bar isn't that high right now. If you can just do the basic stuff that you're already very, you know, maybe paranoid and careful about on the US market, 
just do the same thing in Japan and you should be able to see success, provided all the other boxes are checked, you know, the, the ones we've just talked about. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, I love the example of the big bold font. I, I do see a lot of that in Japan. I mean, even like with, you know, signs and, um, you know, magazines, everything mm -hmm. like in your face and the detail. Nick, anything you would like to add to that? You know, some, maybe some examples? Yeah, of, you know, when marketing. I, yeah, well, the, well, I would, because when I just waffled on earlier on, I, I missed out what, what Ritu said, which is just check your product is a good market fit. That really is very, very important. Um, after checking if the product is okay to sell, which it will be if it's not food related, medical or cosmetics, you will be able to sell, but there will be things you need to do. Outside that, there's nothing you normally need to do. And so the next thing is just checking if it is a good market fit. Um, and people often wonder, well, how do you do that? And um, I normally recommend just, you know, uh, do some image searches uh, on Amazon, on google.jp or, or go and look on um, YouTube and try and find some videos that people have done. So you can kind of see how the product could be used, would be used, especially when it comes to products for kitchens or houses. Like an example I've often used in, in presentations in the past is I've shown them an, an American kitchen and a Japanese kitchen, and they're entirely different. They're entirely different. So if you sell kitchen goods, which is a fairly popular niche or, or household goods uh, or things used in the house, decorations, uh, just have a look at what a Japanese house looks like. I mean, it's just an image search away. Um, often you can find videos of people actually walk through a Japanese house and they'll even speak in English to kind of a video for foreigners to see how Japanese live. And so kind of look how your products could be used, watch videos and see if your product will will be too big, be too well, probably won't be too small, but um, get an idea. And another thing I would say is don't don't go for niche products. Um, you normally want to sell fairly. You normally want to sell the kind of products that you wouldn't be able to sell now uh, in uh, the larger marketplaces like the US because there'd be too much competition. They'd probably be OK for Japan. But if it's a product that sells 10 a day in America now, it'll probably be too niche. Uh, you're probably looking at selling one a day, which isn't a problem because there's lots of brands that have a whole bunch of SKUs. So if we just sell one or two a day, but you sell, you know, 20, 30 SKUs, you can still have a healthy uh, amount of sales in Japan. But if it's not as niche, there's a, because there's less competition, there's a good chance you could even outsell America uh, and certainly it'll lower, lower PPC cost. Well, often, not always, but often. Um, so there will be some research, a lot of research you can do at home on Google. But the points I would add there. Excellent. Talking about research, what tools would you guys recommend? for the Japanese market? I mean, for example, um, like product research. Um, yeah, so I, I use a combination of Jungle Scout and Helium 10, uh, basically start with keyword research, uh, but then there's also Amazon itself, right? Um, like Nick was mentioning, just do a search, uh, just do a search on Amazon itself. Um, and then also look at brand analytics, um, which is great. Um, and it gives you a lot of uh, you know, insights into what's trending, uh, what are the top products there, what, um, you know, what's the search frequency rank, so you can always get an idea of like what the popularity is. Uh, so just using all those available tools for uh, for your research. Excellent. And Nick? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I don't, I don't use um, the tools outside of Amazon myself, but uh, definitely brand analytics as Ritu mentioned, is for me probably the main thing. Um, because I know the categories uh, from the BSRs, I'll, I'll know roughly what the sales would be. So that's that's just from doing it for a long time. But definitely use brand analytics. It's, it's very, very useful. Um, and just the basic things you would do in other marketplaces, look how many reviews they've got, see what their ranking is. I'll be careful with reviews though, actually, because um, if a seller is doing it properly, they will actually sync, synchronize their reviews globally. So you could have someone that starts in Japan with 20,000 reviews just because they've got 20,000 in the US, which is another reason why you should be saying in, in Japan, by the way. That's probably one of the most important things. Totally forgot about that. Sorry. If you've got 20,000 or 10,000 or 5,000 or 100 reviews in America and you sell in Japan, you've probably got 10 times the reviews of everybody else. So you can start like straight away and, be in, like, and, and have more reviews than all the other sellers combined. I mean, the, some of the brands we do, we totally like that. Um, that's one very important thing for Japan because products normally have very a very small number of reviews. Um, 
if you've got a lot of reviews in another marketplace and you bring it to Japan, you instantly start pretty much at the top, but without any sales history, obviously. Um, um, so yeah, tools to use, just look at, look at the products, look at, um, say, but do look at reviews. If it looks like it's only reviews from Japan, you can tell because you can see the reviews are actually in Japanese or not. Um, just the, 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 the basic things. Uh, and if you've got any experience with Japan, you kind of know what products generally do sell well or don't sell well. Um, but if you don't have experience, um, with the marketplace itself and use the tools that Richie mentioned, um, I'm sure Helium 10 and Jungle Scout will give you a good start. Excellent. Excellent. And Nick, I remember several years ago, I mean, you were, you know, people were talking about a uh, U.S. market, you got a niche down. And then in one of the presentations you gave, you said, I mean, Japan is the niche, right? So rather than, yeah. Japan, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, uh, Japan did, is the niche. Yeah. Yeah. It's still I mean, yeah. do you, you still feel the same way today? Yeah. Do, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We, we've been doing some some work, some other brands recently, and they're doing products that you would not want to try and launch in America. You could totally do it in Japan. Um, is, is that because yeah. of lack of competition in Japan? Lack of com lack of competition, lack of um, lack of. I wouldn't say so much lack of competition. There is plenty of competition, but it's not. It looks like there's competition, but it's very unsophisticated. It's companies like Richard just showed an example of that just put it in English. Or it'll be a lot of uh, sellers from other Asian countries, predominantly China, and the listings will be incredibly poor. And their, their listings, obviously, they were targeted at America, and they just tried to import them directly into Japan with no cultural um, translations whatsoever. So there's still lots of competition, but they're just not doing it very well. They're not focusing. People are throwing things on Japan like they would throw it on Poland. I mean, to be honest, I sell in Poland and Sweden, and I haven't translated them. I don't even look at my sales there. Um, because it's such a small market pace and people are doing the same thing to Japan. It's the fourth largest. It's almost as big as the UK. Certain years it's been bigger than the UK. It's not something you throw your products onto. You spend, you know, spend a couple of thousand dollars and make sure it looks really good because you can make a lot more money, a lot more money than you can make in the UK um, selling in Japan. So just kind of take the time and spend the money and focus on it. Don't try and sell in 20 other small marketplaces. Just take a few months out, focus on Japan and uh, it, could, it could pay dividends. Okay, I think you're excellent. muted. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, excellent. So the, the other, one of the big questions a lot of sellers had is, you know, in terms of the Japanese law and regulations that sellers should be aware of. We touched upon the, the IOR, the importer of record requirements. Um, I, I just like to, to cover that. And I, I saw a question earlier from Paul who asked, can you hear the GSD, BATS, uh, PTY, LLC requirement set up in Japan for sellers? I would like to take a shot uh, at that. Shall I, shall I have a quick go at that one? So first of all, you don't need to have a company to sell in Japan. As far as I'm aware, you don't need to have a company to sell in any of the Amazon marketplaces. I'm not sure about India, actually. Um, but no, you don't need to have a company to sell in Japan. You don't need to have... Um, um, Japanese, they call it CT, consumption tax, which is the same as, you know, kind of GST or VAT in other countries. So consumption tax, you don't have to have a consumption tax number. Um, Amazon is now asking, as of last week, for people, sellers to enter in their consumption tax numbers just so that uh, in the near future, they'll actually break down the price and the consumption tax for businesses that do have it, but it's not a requirement. So you, 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 are, you don't need to have a Japanese business. You don't need to be located here. You don't need to have Japanese staff. Um, although in theory, you are supposed to be able to um, answer customer queries in the native language that is actually an Amazon requirement. So, um, and then when it comes to tax, I don't really, I, I do kind of know the situation, but I don't really want to talk about it because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not licensed to do that. Um, but I will tell you that it's a lot, uh, it's a lot easier and the VAT will be uh, a lot lower if not zero, unless you have over a hundred thousand yen in, no, a million yen. So a hundred thousand dollars roughly in sales a year. In theory, you don't need to pay consumption tax, but that's, that's, it's quite nuanced and I'm not going to get into that here, but your, your tax will definitely be a lot less than certainly Europe. I can, I can assure you. And you don't have to pay into your third year anyway. So, I mean, uh, 
Uh, I wouldn't speak to somebody about it, though. Excellent. Okay. Any, um, well, Karen asked, she commented, I've connected Japan to my Seller Central account, but asking me to provide the Japan consumption tax number, the TT. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's asked, yeah it's, it's been asking for the last week. It's not a requirement as far as I'm aware. Obviously, we, we do, but we've got brands that we're running and they don't have, um, they're not registered in Japan yet, so they don't have a number. It just says to connect it. Um, it doesn't say it's a requirement. Um, it's, it's basically for invoicing. So it's the same as Europe. Uh, so in Europe, if you sell in Europe, you'll be aware that Amazon provides a service where they will send, they will make up um, uh, VAT invoices for customers, uh, but you need to have a VAT number for that, but they just won't make a VAT number. They won't make a VAT invoice for you if you're not registered. Um, so it's not a problem. It's not a requirement. You just do it if right. you have the number. Okay, cool. Um, I, I mean, obviously we're not like legal experts, but what other laws or regulations should sellers be aware of and i know that nick you touched upon earlier some of the like the food um you know food compliance um you know stuff like that okay. yeah well there's actually there's, there's there's a question here this is from paul um mm -hmm. so so a yuri is required no you don't need a yuri number that's the number that's used uh, like an important number for europe you don't need to have an important number no um so is it three feels the same way yes you can yes yes you can yeah, so you can send products into a 3PL and then they can send them into Amazon or you can send it to Amazon directly if the products don't have any um, um, requirements to be tested. Uh, so what, what was the question, Gary? Any any other things, any other requirements? Yeah, that, that um, yeah any other laws, regulations that sellers need to be aware of? To, to I can't really think of it. I know I'm kind of saying a lot of things. It sounds very scary, but if anyone's selling in Europe, it's a damn sight easier. <laughs> It's way easier than Europe, believe me. And probably, I don't know about the US, um, but um, I can't think. I mean, there may be, ah, I mean, there are small, there are, there, there's always going to be small things, but that's why you want to speak to somebody, an importer. So, for example, if you sell children's toys, it's meant for children under six, you need to have um, a sticker on it that says not for use by under six year olds. Uh, and that label has to be on a certain size font, for example. Um, but on the flip side, there's no requirement in Japan to have suffocation warnings on bags. It's kind of, it's really crazy. Well, some things are strict, some things are incredibly, obviously you should have suffocation warnings and in Japanese, but it's not a requirement. Um, so there's some things where Japan is actually very lax, very lax, and some things where they're oddly very strict, especially when it comes to um, the food products, uh, food containers. But there may be certain niche things that check, you need to check with an importer. Uh, like what your product is and does it have any requirements? Okay, excellent. So I, I'd like I, to, I want, yeah, sorry uh, too. So, uh, you know, I, I think Nick might be able to um, elaborate on this more, but, um, you know, I, I think there's also another requirement uh, of uh, being tax registered in the prefectures where Amazon has warehouses. Um, and that might be a one-time thing in the beginning and then you don't need to worry about it. So wherever, like there's, I believe there's four prefectures where Amazon has warehouses uh, that you might need to be registered in. But I think Nick might be able to answer that. I don't, I don't think there is a requirement for that. I haven't heard that. Um, I don't know, I don't, that's interesting. I've, I've never heard that. And none of the brands that, that, that we run have ever been asked for that either. And they're not registered here. So I don't actually know. Uh, and Japan is, is they, they are increasing the number of warehouses as well. They hadn't added another one about a month ago. So the areas would actually be increasing anyway. I haven't heard that and we haven't been requested, but that doesn't mean to say that it's not a requirement. Mm -hmm. I'll actually check on that. I'll actually check on that. Mm. Great yeah. point, me too. Okay. We have a question in the chat from Roz who asks, um, what is the first step in researching what testing or regulations apply for your products? Do you recommend a website that can be used for a quick check or service provider, or is it as simple as a Google search? You could start with a Google search, but I would speak to a service provider. Uh, I can give you the names of some people to, you could speak to as well. Um, it's one of those things, it's kind of like legal thing. Well, it's a legal thing, I guess. I mean, you could, you could Google laws, 
um, but you probably want to speak to a lawyer before you do anything that could impact that. Um, so certainly do, if you do Google searches in English, the Japanese, some of the Japanese authorities uh, branches are quite good now, like the customs office, for example, or the, that food sanitation um, act, the, the department's in charge of that. They've got their websites in English now. So if you do an English web search, um, there's a good chance that you will find the government site with English on it. And that will obviously be the information you need to know. Um, and they are quite clear. It might be quite a lot to read through. Um, but if if you are going to get anything from the internet, make sure it's the original source, make sure it's the government body that's involved. And you'll it, it'll be clear from the website if they are or not. Okay, excellent. Um, and guys, you know, I think this is a valuable opportunity. So and we are on Zoom. So if you like to ask your question, unmute yourself, you know, do feel free if you have to, want to ask, you know, something else beyond that. I know that, you know, I've spoken with Roz, uh previously. I know that, you know, he runs a number of, uh, of brands as well. So he's highly interested in, in joining our event that I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, um, can, I, can I add, if, if, if yeah. that, the whole point of the event is that you've got all these things we, we're talking about, like service providers, and you need to speak to this person, that person, they will be there. Yeah. So it will just make the whole thing a hell of a lot easier, as opposed to me yes. saying you need to do this, you need to do that. <laughs> so just speak to that guy, speak to that guy, yes, and then yes. you'll be fine. That's the okay. whole idea of okay. the event. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually, I haven't even introduced the event yet, but I-, I Okay, think, that's right, okay, forget you know, that. Everyone... Yeah, I mean, like, the cat is kind of, like, coming out of the bag. So maybe <laughs> I should introduce the event first, and then just want you guys to know. Um, so let me, okay, let me just screen share one second. And we, we can talk some I, more I, about I thought you mentioned it. Sorry, so that's why, uh, that's uh, why I, I mentioned it. Yeah, I did mention, okay. So, I mean- so we talked, I mean, we covered a lot about these laws and regulations and, you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you should start selling it. And we talked about many of them, you know, what the biggest market, you know, lower PPC, less competition and unsophisticated competition, not just less, but unsophisticated competition. Um, you don't, you don't need to necessarily need to know Japanese to sell in Japan. You know, I, I'm by no means... Japanese fluent at all you know I'm like maybe first grade level I'm selling in Japan right I mean obviously you need some help but seller central is in English um you know lower shipping and faster shipping we haven't even talked about that uh Amazon Japan's largest e-com marketplace and um you know, 140 million people in Japan 80 percent of them shop online Amazon is the number one Japan e-commerce platform you don't need to register a company so we cover that uh, they're the unique marketing channel, but maybe we can talk about that in a minute after we talk about the event. And if you're already selling in the US or EU, you know, possibly, you know, you may have an advantage, like what they talked about with that review mode. If you have like, you know, 500 reviews, that's you, know, you can import that in Japan. The threshold in Japan is a lot lower than the US and other markets. So possibly, yeah, if you, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you have 100 reviews, you could be you know, probably the most reviewed garlic press in Japan. And, and I don't know what it is now, but I remember a conference, uh, a talk I did about four years ago, and the top product had less than 100 at that time. I mean, it's crazy. Even 100 reviews would, would put you way ahead of probably yeah. pretty much everyone in many of the categories apart from um, electronics. Yeah. And, and I mean, there, granted, there are steps to take, right? I mean, the importer of record, you got to check the compliance. But think of this, you know, like, you know, one of our good friends, Chris Davy. You know, he says, like, he views all these, like, loops he has to go through, these hurdles, as, you know, moats, right? These are barriers to entry. Most yeah. sellers are not willing to do that. But for the driven sellers like you guys, if you do want to do yeah. that, you guys will have the advantage, right? You will have, you'll be behind that moat, all right? So I wanted to offer this unique opportunity. I mean, we talked about a lot, but this is the iceberg. So i like to introduce this brand new event that I don't think anybody has ever done this event. Um, we're going to have an in-person seven-figure seller Japan mastermind in Tokyo next year, April 4th to the 5th. Okay, so this will be a two-day event. Nick is going to be there in person. Ritu is going to be there. We're going to have a host of other seven, eight-figure sellers in Japan, brand owners and service providers to really give you guys a turnkey solution to selling to Japan. I mean, you know, like what Nick was saying, right? I mean, 
you know, Roslyn's asking about that. Okay, I mean, at that event, all these people are going to be in the room with you. Okay, so literally, you can find that IOR. You can find out your questions about compliance, about this product, about that product. You know, we're literally going to leave no stone unturned in this event. I think this is going to be like a game changer for people that want to sell to Japan. Um, you know, which we'll talk about launch strategies unique to Japan. You know, I was talking to one seven-figure seller that already uh, put down his deposit. You know, he's selling in nine marketplaces right now. Japan is the only one is like the nut that he couldn't crack, right? The same launch strategies that work in the other markets don't work for Japan. So he, he's coming to Japan. I mean, he's going to he's gonna break this down, you know, break down the barrier, right? Um, you know, we'll cover like all, all different marketing strategies besides just PPC. Um, and really, you'll be able to make all the connections you need. Um, so I'm super excited about this opportunity, guys. Um, it's going to be a two-day event happening in Japan, in person, in Tokyo, April 4th and the 5th. Um, day one, we're going to cover uh, selling on Japan from A to Z. Uh, there will be plenty of networking opportunities as well. Because I know that you know, a lot of times we learn more you know, over coffee or at the lunch table than the conference table, right? So we're going to have plenty of networking opportunities besides the actual talks. And one thing that's unique, and this, I mean, I think this is like the best time of year to visit Japan. Um, and there's actually going to be the cherry blossom season happening in April. So this literally, I mean, tourists are flying in from Europe, from North America, just to see this. So we're going to, besides the business side, we're going to offer this unique cherry blossom networking night out in a Tokyo park. So we're going to lay down a spread. We're going to um, offer some choice of sake, you know, Japanese beer, whiskey, uh, sushi, bento boxes, you name it. And, you know, we'll invite all of the speakers. So, you know, I think it will be a great once in a lifetime opportunity to experience Japan beyond just the business side. I, I've talked to, you know, a number of you guys and, you know, people want to see like, you know, have that nice dinner or maybe go to Kyoto, see some geishas. You know, we may have some optional, um, you know, events as well in addition to that. So that's day one, April 4th. And day two, April 5th, we're going to break up into more small groups, mastermind workshops, going around in hot seats where you will be able to personally ask all the questions you want about your business, about your product. You know, we'll do life breakdowns about, you know, what products, you know, if it's going to work in Japan or maybe some adjustments will be needed, um, you know, finding the right partners, you name it. So that will be day two. Um, so this will be the two day event. Um, you know, I'm personally super excited about this and literally, um, you know, I don't think anyone has ever done an event in Japan before, you know, we'll also have the cherry blossoms, uh, social events and, um, yeah. And, you know, I, I've, I've talked to a number of you guys, you know, some frequently asked questions, do I need a visa to enter Japan for about, I think over 68 countries can enter Japan visa free, I mean, US, UK, Europe. Check with your, um, you know, your embassy. But for most countries, you can just land in Japan. You're good to go. Okay, no visa required. Is Japan super expensive? Um, okay, Nick, what do you think? Is Japan super Japan, expensive? Yeah. Japan's super cheap. I mean, when when Japanese people go to Thailand, they think it's expensive. <laughs> Seriously, that's what my wife was saying. You know, going from Bangkok, Japan to Bangkok is probably more yeah. expensive than Tokyo. You can still go yeah. out and have a pretty good like meat on rice meal, like like the Japanese people do, and it'll cost you four bucks. You know, five hundred yen or something. It's like yeah. it's cheap, and with the exchange rate now, I mean, the yen is probably weaker than just about every single currency. So, um, it yeah. Yeah, it's very, very. I mean, you can make it very expensive if you wanted to, but you'd really have to be trying. Generally, yeah. it's apart from maybe hotels. Everything in Japan, hotels are probably on par with most other cities, if not slightly cheaper. Um, but everything else, like eating out, drinking, everything is very, very cheap. Everything will be. There's no tipping in yeah. Japan either. So when you go out, there's no tipping. No, no, no. And Japan is probably one of the cheapest countries you can actually come to, spe specifically now as well with the exchange rates. Yeah, I mean, the exchange rate is at about, I think, almost 30-year low against USD. So, you know, one of my yeah. friends just went to um, visit Japan just for fun. You know, he said, you know, it's, it was a bargain. I mean, compared to what he was saying in the U.S., right? Because U.S. inflation mm. is out of control. So, yeah. Um, Ritu, any thoughts on that? Like, is Japan expensive in no. your view? No, it is 
since like when I used to live in Japan, I lived there for 17 years. And when I, I moved from Japan to the US, I was like, oh my goodness, this place is expensive. And then when I moved to Canada, again, it was the same. I just, just remember Japan as being so affordable, especially as Nick said, food is so affordable. And uh, even hotels, like you don't have to go to a fancy hotel, even the the most kind of basic uh, BNBs, um, they are clean and, you know, mm. Japanese are very meticulous about, you know, their cleanliness, their punctuality. You'll have a good experience even, even in a motel type of hotel. Uh, so I think Japan is very, very affordable by all standards. Yeah, I mean, there hasn't really been inflation here for the last 30 years. I've been here for 27 years. And the prices when I came here are the same as they are now. Some things are actually cheaper. So, I mean, yeah, it's like the prices have been the same for years and years in Japan. So other countries have got more expensive. Japan's just stayed the same. Japan was expensive in the 80s. It, I agree. Yeah, some things are expensive in Japan. Like real estate is expensive because yeah. it's in short supply. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's expensive. Yeah. yeah. The hotel rooms will be smaller, guys. So don't oh, expect really? something, you know, extravagant. I mean, but yeah. even then, I mean, they, they are pretty decent. I mean, when I, I do a lot of business trips to Tokyo and stuff, and I stay in, you know, they're not big rooms. They're, they're reasonable no. and, they're, and they are cheap. It's certainly yeah. a lot cheaper oh, than would if I was to go to London. Okay. And Excellent. cleaner, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is very clean. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think this will be a great opportunity, guys. And uh, we're offering a super early bird package right now, and it's seven ninety nine. And it's uh, we're only going to offer this until Friday. I mean, because you guys joined on this webinar, I wanted to offer this special price to you guys. I will drop the link in the chat. It's seven figure seller summit dot com slash blog blog slash seven figure seller Japan mastermind dash com. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Uh, you can just click through to find out more detail. All right. Um, let, let's let circle back. I know there were a couple of questions, guys. Um, Karen said, random question. I'm going to stop the screen share for a second. Okay. Um, Karen said, Amazon is doing a verification of my Japan seller account is requesting a bill for piped or natural gas, electricity, water, or internet with my name and address. My business does not receive or pay such bills. Do you know what I might submit to them instead of that? Yeah, Amazon does do these checks on sellers. Uh, I've, I, I've heard this a lot. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm sure there's some forums you can find that will have an answer for that. Um, this is quite a common problem. Uh, I don't know if they'll take telephone, um, um, mobile phone uh, bills as well. Sometimes they don't. If, if if they do accept that, then you can get you can get ones online um, and use that. Sorry, I don't have an answer. For yeah. that. I, don't if, uh, okay. if, I don't. If yeah, I don't know. No. This is uh, a, this is a kind of question you get in a lot of different situations. Yes. Yes. Um, I've come across it a few times. I. I yeah. I. I remember. Um, I don't know if you have a lease or something. If you do have a lease, maybe you can get like what they call a rider on the lease. Like in the States, you can do that. So, you know, if you are renting a property, it's not in your name. You may be able to get that. Parent. But I um, hope that helps. But yeah, it might be a little outside the scope for today. Uh, Paul yeah. asks, please discuss the research software aspect, how to check real sales and categories. Do we use Helium 10, et cetera, other? Um, yeah, I, I can I can take that. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I generally use a combination of uh, Helium 10 and Jungle Scout both because they will give you, uh, like you can do a reverse ASIN and you can kind of get some idea of like uh, keyword sales and stuff like that. So if you have Helium 10, that's probably the easiest. Um, just use that. Um, yeah, I can't, I don't think there's an, I think there's Zon Guru or something like that also has some tools, but I've never used them. I, I prefer just Helium 10 and Jungle Scout. Which one do, do you find better, by the way? Is, is one more accurate uh, for Japan than the other? You know, I found Jungle Scout to be a little bit uh, more expensive than Helium 10. Um, and I was using Jungle Scout before Helium 10 came up 
with came out with their Japanese support because uh, for the longest mm. time they didn't have support in Japan. I know. <laughs> yeah, so I was using uh, Jungle Scout's kind of basic plan, um, and that didn't allow me more than a certain number of searches per day. So it was very frustrating because um, the basic plan itself was sixty nine dollars or something. Uh, and then I could only do three searches a day. So I had to wait for, for the next day to, to do my next search. Uh, but then as soon as Helium 10 came out with it, I just canceled my Jungle Scout uh, subscription and just uh, used Helium 10 for it. So I, I generally use it for all the markets. So um, it's more economical for me. Um, but do, then, do you find it's accurate though? Do you think? Is it, does it seem to be accurate for Japan? Yeah, it is. It is fairly accurate. Now, you know, with the Japanese language, there's a few different kind of uh, um, kind of nuances that, you know, um, a software like Helium 10 may not catch. So you need, you know, someone uh, who understands Japanese to be able to kind of uh, get those right. Um, you know, it's it's to do with the, the scripts that are used in Japan, like the, the hiragana, the katakana, the kanji, and the romaji. Uh, Japanese people like to use all of them together. Um, and so, um, you know, if you have someone um, do a quick review of the research, uh, then you might be able to, um, I guess you'll have a better chance at success if uh, if you take the help of a service provider uh, that that can, you know, that understands this uh, this whole area. So we have been offering this um, at PPC Ninja. We, we have been doing this for uh, some of the aggregators who have like kind of uh, taken their products to Japan. And so it's um it's a bunch of steps but um i think it's um, um it, it is definitely um uh, i guess i wouldn't say that it's super easy uh, it it does require a few a uh, few steps but it's not impossible right you can get a list of keywords out and then you'll need someone to look through the, those uh, or if you want to do another kind of google search or a Google Translate on that to see if you've got the right word, and then uh, you can kind of pick words that way. Uh, but yes, uh, it's all of this is doable, and I think uh, we'll have more uh, on on this um, at the, at the conference as well. Definitely, and um, just to let you guys know, Ritu and PPC Ninja's team were helping me with one of my Japanese listings, and they helped a lot when it came to the. Japanese in language keyword research, you know, finding out some of the uh, keywords my competitors were ranking for, as well as, you know, some of the nuances. There's like, you know, cultural nuances with one of the outdoor, um, you know, toy products that, that I'm selling. So um, if you would like some help, I know that, you know, we too and PPC Ninja team does offer that service. Um, what's the best way to connect with, with you, Ritu, if people want to learn more about that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just my name, Ritu, R-I-T-U, at ppcninja.com uh, should be good. And, um, you know, it will come straight to me and I can uh, connect you to my team. Um, I have Japanese speaking, um, you know, uh, people on my team. So um, we can kind of help you out with uh, localization and keyword research and even product market fit. Uh, as Excellent. Well. Okay, great. Um... So my team member, Larnie, you know, we we're talking about Jungle Cal. My team member, Larnie, is dropping in a link for Jungle Cal if you want to check it out. Uh, we do have a discount, 50% off Jungle Cal if you want to check that out. And we also have a link for Helium 10. That if Larnie, if you can please drop that in the chat as well. Um, me too. I, I understand that PPC Ninja has a 14-day free trial. Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, our software PPC Ninja uh, also does uh, Japanese, uh, you know, basically you can do PPC in Japanese and, um, you know, all the keyword discovery uh, from your search terms, etc. Uh, can happen pretty much uh, automatically and you can apply bits. Uh, so it's a PPC software that works in Japan and in other markets. Um, and yes, we have a 14 day free trial um, for uh, for anyone that wants to sign up. Um, and if anyone from this group wants to you know, extend your free trial, just write to us and we'll extend it by another 15 days. So just for today, for this uh, group. Awesome. Um, how do they redeem? Is it at the URL that you gave us or should they contact you? Yeah, uh, yes. So the URL is just, um, you know, yeah, exactly. The URL would be great. It's just go to our website, ppcninja.com, and uh, there's a sign up yeah. button at the back. Uh, and yeah, this is the link that uh, uh, Lani has uh, okay. uh, put in. So yeah, that, that would be a good okay. one. To do. 
Perfect. Sounds good. Um, sorry, for Helium 10, um, that is not the right link. That's actually for their past event. We'll find the right link. We'll drop that in the chat if you guys need it. All right. Um, I know we're over time. Nick and Ritu, do you have a few more minutes or do you have to run? Yep. I'm okay. I had, a, I had an early lunch. Okay. Um, Nick, I wanted to ask you about that that marketing um, marketing you know channel for Japan that not too many people are aware of. Can you share a little bit about that and why sellers might want to use that um, selling on Amazon Japan? Um, so you're talking about Line, which is a messaging app, uh, the same as something like Messenger or or WhatsApp would be in another country. So for example, I'm from the UK. In the UK, most people use WhatsApp. In Japan, not most people use Line. Everyone use, uses Line. You won't find a single person, whether they be a teenager or in their you know, later years, they will be using Line. It is the most pervasive app I've seen in any country. Ah, oh, that's not true. We, we chat in China, maybe it's the same kind of, um, the same kind of thing. Um, but everybody is online and it's a very, very effective um, uh, way of contacting customers. So customers follow, well, they don't follow you, they friend you. Um, so the brands that we, that we do, we, we start off with a way for customers to get onto the line group and we build the line group up as you would build up, uh, say, a messenger group. Um, it has some um, bot and chat features, a bit like um, messenger does. Um, and we use that, we use it all the time. Uh, any sales, any deal of the days, any new products, if we want reviews in a whitish, whitish hat way, um, we just contact the group, um, the line groups, and they're incredibly responsive. Um, li line is, um, it's people like to get uh, discounts from it, so people tend to stay on the groups. Um, and it's just a very effective marketing um, tool, um, as you would use you know, WhatsApp or Messenger. Excellent. Well, that's Excellent. it in a nutshell, yeah. Yeah, and um, I believe Nick will be sharing more about that at the event, at the conference in April as well. Um, because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Nick shared with me previously, you know, the cool stuff he's doing, you know, building an audience so he can you know, retarget to, offer, you know, there's like insert cards, there's ways that you can capture their, um, you know, contact information, a lot of cool stuff that you can do. Uh, you know, beyond what we can talk about today. So, yeah, um, yeah, excellent. Nick, what's the best way for people to follow up with you that they want to learn more? Uh, the easiest way to contact me, I mean, I've got so many emails. Uh, as opposed to using the company one, just, just send to my private email, it's fine. So my family name is Katz, which is K-A-T-Z. And my first name is Nick. So K-A-T-Z-N-I-C-K, Katznick at gmail.com. It's probably the easiest one to use let's just use that one for now okay, um great. and you can contact me if you are considering we do account management i'm in japan uh this, our office is in japan we've got a warehouse here all my staff are japanese um oh. so we've been doing this for a very long time yeah and normally you work with the larger brand is that correct normally the larger brands yeah we can't really take on the smaller brands unfortunately it's just a time restraint um oh. But certainly any larger brands who are looking to enter Japan, um, yeah. we could certainly uh, talk to you um, yeah. and discuss the best way forward. I remember you mentioned for Prime Day, you helped a, a large US brand really crush it in Japan. Like, can you quickly share what, what happened? Um, so for that brand, yeah, it was their first Prime Day. We did 13x sales on both days. And actually, just the the, um, the Black Friday, it was slightly different in Japan. The Black Friday mm -hmm. week, we did about the same as well on odd days. We did about 13x the normal sales, which is um, pretty good. Uh, again, using things like uh, the line. Um, and there are a lot of other kind of things you can do in Japan if you're a bigger brand because we have an account manager. Um, who we can utilize to do various things. So we actually got a lot yeah. of sales at a very low, at a discount less than you actually are supposed to have. So the profit margins were good as well. Excellent. 
but it's sure. it's just it's just list building. We've we've been building since the very very beginning. All the brands we we just we we start building the lists for times just like this. So you contact them and you you get you know hundreds of sales in the first hour or two. Okay, excellent. So if you do want to learn more, guys, about selling in Japan, we do have our in person events. So again, super early bird ticket expires this Friday. Um, you can get it at the URL I put it in the chat. So any other questions, guys, before we run? Uh, I, I'm super grateful to read to, super grateful to, to Nick um, for their time today. Jason asks, is Shopkeeper or Amishet Yeah, good now for research? Okay, so Amishetti, I don't think is currently running at the moment. Um, so the developer, Phil, I don't think he was able to, he's updated it to the new, Amazon has a new API um, as of a few months ago. So a lot of tools had problems because of that. And Shopkeeper, I used to use Shopkeeper for years. It used to be AMZ Ping, Shopkeeper. I don't think it's, I don't think it's got any research tools. It's it's just uh, like an account management. It gives you sales and data like that. I don't think it has research on it. So I don't, I don't yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, one of the best research tools is really using Amazon itself using um, the brand registry tools. So using um, analy brand analytics, you know, go and find the biggest selling. You can find the list, you know, top hundred lists, go and find the first three products, do reverse ace in searches on those. You'll, you'll see what products they're ranking for. So what keywords they're ranking for. And you could do a lot of information just through your own dashboard. And if you've got yeah. an account anywhere in the world, sorry, Oh, no, you're going to have to have a Japanese account, aren't you, to be able to do brand analytics for Japan. But it's it's obviously free to have an account. I, just in case anybody out there who doesn't sell on, on another marketplace, if you're paying your professional seller account on Amazon, your monthly $50, or whatever it is, uh, it's the same. It's free to add any other marketplace. So just add Japan anyway. Um, I mean, just why not? <laughs> it's yeah. free. Add it, yeah. and then you can use brand analytics. Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming on today. Um, I hope this was helpful to, to you guys to, you know, to enter the Japanese market. Remember, it is the fourth biggest marketplace. Not that much competition. Competition is unsophisticated. Lower PPC cost. Faster shipping times, you know, from China. I, I think it's a no-brainer. So uh, even if you can't join us in Tokyo, um, I hope you guys will consider the opportunity. If you can join us, I think it will be an amazing once in a lifetime, unique opportunity to really accelerate selling into Japan, you know, learning from experts like Nick, like me too. And we'll have many others as well, um, you know, service providers. And um, we will go from there. So thank you so much, everybody. We will see you guys at the next session. Bye everyone. I hope to see everyone in uh, Japan next year. <laughs> Thanks, Absolutely. everyone, for your time. Yep. Aaron, I see you're out there. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, guys. Bye.